thanks for the uh, for the uh, the very pressured title that you've given us there on, on customer, you know, citizen focused contact and experience. So hopefully we'll be able to show you what we've done over the, the past few years. Um, so I'm, I am going to start off by um, just, well, just talking a little bit about what Paul was talking about earlier about the, the building blocks that, that got us to where we are now. Um, and, and sort of our, our journey really in, in customer services, um, you know, and how we've changed to, um, to meet uh, ever-changing demands from our customers, um, but also um, emerging technologies and how we can actually exploit them to get the best out of um, what's available to us and, and available to customers. So um, as when I was preparing this um, presentation, I was starting to look back at, at how we actually started in customer services back in 2004. Um, and we started off with a very simple vision of what we wanted to achieve, um, which was providing first class services uh, to our residents by offering simple accessible solutions, listening and responding to feedback, constantly reviewing business practices and data, and getting it right first time. Um, and, and actually, when we look back at it, that, that's not changed. Um, but, but what we've now started to look at is, is our aspirations. Where do we want to be um, in, in this new modern um, digital environment? Um, so, so we want to have highly satisfied, engaged residents accessing services by the channel of the choice. Um, in no particular order, website, uh, you know, self-service, um, web assistant, uh, which is our automated chatbot, which I'll be going into in more detail, supporting customers through chat, social media, Google business services, SMS. Um, and then finally, assisted digital. So, you know, and this, is, this is kind of our nirvana um, of being able to focus more on assisted digital. We, in Blackburn, um, you know, whilst we, um, do try and focus on digital. We do also have a lot of digitally excluded residents. Um, we've got very high poverty rates in, in uh, Blackburn um, with low online take up. So, so we're looking to provide assisted digital services by uh, more traditional channels, telephone, email, face to face and white mail. And ultimately reducing our cost to serve um, by user research, complaints, investigation, feedback, repeat and unnecessary contact. So some of the challenges that we faced, um, and this is the same for everyone, um, you know, when, when austerity started in the early uh, 20, well, in, in 2010, 2011, um, you know, we had significant budget and, and resource reductions, but we also had the same staff, uh, sorry, the, the same demand, but, but using less staff. And, and we had to reduce our opening times. And this brought further problems because we were meeting the same demand, but in um, a narrow window um, of opening. Um, so that created uh, its own problems. And some of those budget and uh, resource challenges we're going to start seeing again, uh, you know, during post down, post lockdown recovery. Um, We've seen changes in customer behaviours, uh, emerging channels, um, so things like social media, web website, chat. So when we started getting into austerity, you know, customers' behaviour started to change as well. And we have the, the likes of Amazon, EasyJet to thank for, for the, the sort of the high demand or the, the on-demand services that they offer and people expected that from local authorities but at the time we weren't necessarily mature enough to actually be able to adapt to some of them changes and, and as Paul said in, in, in his opening there was in, in some parts um, you know of the organisation there's a lack of appetite for change and, and a lot of transformation was actually delivered or, or, or driven by pockets of, of, of services and, and individuals. We looked at this as an opportunity to, to change um, and actually um, deliver some real, um, well, first of all, savings, but also to try and maintain quality services. We looked at doing things slightly differently um, and we invested in technologies to start off with to, to deliver cashable year on year savings. We started to look at value and non-value contacts to see if we could do things differently and ultimately to start, start our journey on driving channel shift. So what did we do? Um, so this is really within just the customer services team. So, so on 
Nick's background, you saw a, a very nice picture of the town hall. Um, and in the background to that was a great big tower block. Now, our contact centre or, or our customer service team were split between two buildings. So our contact centre was actually at the top of the tower block and we had reception services in at the front of the town hall. So the first thing that we did was moved uh, the contact centre uh, and co-located it next to reception. And we started to train up staff to be multi-skilled, uh, so delivering wide range of services, but also multidisciplined as well, so that they could switch between telephone, email, chat, in person, um, dependent on where the demand was. Um, and that was a real change for us, but it actually brought a lot of economies of scale um, because we were able to absorb savings, staffing reductions by um, multi-skilling and, and multidisciplined advisors. And we started our digital journey. So, so we, we started with an online account and this was our first iteration of CRM, um, which had some integration uh, for certain services, but the vast majority of it was driven by inquiry forms on our website. Um, and we also looked at a, a mobile app um, as a solution for mobile issues. So, so the mobile app was uh, allowing customers to report environmental issues, street issues, take a photograph, location services, um, and, and, and allowing them to report stuff to us 24 seven, um, you know, whilst they were out and about. Telephones, um, we looked at, uh, like I say, non-value and value services. And the first thing that we, we looked at was our general inquiry service. Um, so around about 2013, 2014, we were handling up to 600 calls a day on general inquiries. And, and around about 70% of those inquiries were non-value to us, where we were transferring a customer to, or a caller to either a named extension or to another service, despite offering um, menu options for, for our uh, most frequently accessed services. So we, we procured and, 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 in, and um, implemented an automated switchboard on our main number, uh, 585585. And what that allowed us to do was actually take away those non-value services. Our customer service team, our, our contact centre staff, all handled general inquiries on top of their existing um, specialised areas. So automating it actually freed up more time for them to be dealing with what we, we classed as value services, um, you know, where they were supporting and engaging with customers on on whatever their inquiry was and that very quickly turned uh, the volume of calls that we were handling on the automated switchboard to now we're, we're handling less than 100 calls a day um, so it varies between 8 and 100 so we've had a significant reduction in very short non-value calls um, and customers are able to get directly through to where they want to speak to um, you know, with a few words. So we have um, uh, phrase recognition on it. Uh, so if someone, you know, wants to speak to us about council tax, they can, you know, we have people ask for Maggie tax, poll tax, local rates. It recognises those phrases and it put, puts them through. And we've done a lot of work with services and departments to understand what customers will ask for, for their particular service to ensure they're being routed through to the right place. We've also used voice forms um, quite extensively on simple transactional um, requests. Um, we, we started looking at this on our environment services. Um, a couple of really good examples of where we've deployed these um, are Miss Bin Collections or Miss Bin Reports um, and uh, bulky item removals. So, Prior to us using voice forms, uh, they were on demand services, customers would go through to an advisor and, and we were looking at things like average handling times and they were taking around about four and a half minutes to complete that service request. Part of that call was, was rapport building, um, you know, and, and actually when we, we looked at actually the the, the, the resolution side of it, it was taking around a minute. So so what we did with the voice forms was was replace that, that human interaction um, and opened up those reporting lines 24-7. Um, and that helped us to manage uh, peaks and troughs in demand. So, you know, miss bin reports, we tended to see a lot of people ringing up first thing in the morning. Um, coming home from night at five, you know, from work at five o'clock, uh, we weren't open, so they were waiting until the next day. 
they can now report 24 seven if they haven't got access to the internet um, and self-serving, they can report it through voice forms. We will call them back uh, with a resolution. So, and that resolution call takes around about a minute because we're just coming back to them to say, this is when we're going to be coming back to you, or this is when we're going to be uh, removing those items. So we made around about 75% uh, efficiency saving on, on certain service uh, requests. And the other thing that we did to manage demand with reduced staffing levels, we saw increased queue times, abandon rates. So we introduced callback facilities uh, in queue. Uh, so whilst people were waiting, they were given the option to request a callback by pressing one. Initially, we used voice forms uh, to do that um, and we responded within 24 hours. But in the last 18 months, we started using uh, a queue buster facility, which simplifies that process a lot. Uh, well, it makes it a lot easier. Custom, it, the, the system automatically captures the customer's number, um, keeps the call in the queue, um, and then we call them back. Um, very simple, and, and we are calling people back within a couple of hours. Uh, so in terms of a, the experience, customers aren't having to wait, and they, you know, we're calling them back uh, when we're available. Um, and then finally, in person, uh, so in our reception centres, we eliminated a point, uh, sorry, eliminated drop-in services and introduced appointments. Um, and to mitigate this, we introduced a meet and greet service. Um, and this was in um, conjunction with adding public access facilities. So we had public access PCs where customers could access council services um, if they didn't have devices at home, but we also had public access phones. So the meet and greet service was uh, an initial fact find to see why someone had come in to see us. And the, the, the staff with um, who were meeting and greeting had tablets, Bluetooth uh, device, uh, Bluetooth headsets, um, and they had access to things like uh, queue data. Uh, so they could see whether the telephone lines were busy um, and they were able to offer alternatives to customers. But also when we had corporate visitors, um, because they were mobile, staff were able to ring um, uh, a meeting organizer to let them know that visitors were, were here. Um, and, and it just made the, the whole process a lot smoother. Um, and with all of this, we uh, we redeployed staff. So we kind of changed what they were doing. So rather than fulfilling a lot of requests, um, staff uh, in the reception areas were providing floor walking support in our public access facilities and helping people to self-serve. Just one, I'm just gonna to touch quickly on, on one service that, that we actually started our transformation journey really early. Um, and this was our blue badge service. For those of you that um, uh, uh, deliver blue badge services, um, there was a big push nationally um, in 2012 to move to a national database uh, called the blue, blue badge improvement service. Pre-2012, uh, blue badge services were, were local. Um, so, so there was no joined up um, uh, approach uh, across councils, uh, admin staff were producing their own badges, it was very resource in intensive and quite disjointed, but it was also open to abuse. Um, but because of the, the paper trails and the way that the service was set up, there was significant processing time, so you're looking at up to three months or 12 weeks. We did a lot of consultation with disability groups, blue badge holders at the time to see if we could change the way that we delivered that service. And we took the opportunity of BBIS to, to actually move to a wholly online solution from the 1st of January, 2012, using the national solution uh, provided by DWP. Um, we allowed customers to submit or submit evidences digitally, um, but we also provided verific verification services um, in our one-stop shops. And in the contact center, we provided assisted digital services. So for people that didn't have access to um, online, um, they could ring up, we would make an appointment and we would complete the application form over the phone with them. Um, well, the first thing that we saw within a couple of months was, was processing times reduced into four to six weeks because um, the, the whole process was a lot slicker. Um, but the other thing that we saw initially with the assisted digital service was that around about 70% of the applications were submitted through digital assistance, 30% um, uh, self-service. And that led to 
delays in, in appointments. Um, and very quickly, we saw customers adapting to, to the way that we'd uh, change the service. Um, and we're getting help from family, um, friends, people in the household to submit applications. To the point where we are now, it, it's very well established and, and customer blue badge holders are through their, probably their third or fourth um, renewal um, site in, you know, in the, in the uh, blue badge cycle and, and know now how to apply what, what they can get from us. So, so it is very much digital first. 90% um, of our applications are now done online uh, through self-service. Um, we provide SMS and email reminders to customers uh, approaching renewal. Um, and we do that in a, in a staggered approach. So two months before, a month before, two weeks before expiry, just a reminder, reapply. Uh, evidence submissions um, are now done digitally, um, but we're also supported now through Searchlight. So on automatic criteria, um, we are using Searchlight to um, query DWP uh, awards, and, and that's making it a lot easier for, for people um, that, that don't have to now provide paper copies or, or, or digital copies of their award letter. We can do that ourselves now. Um, and what that's allowed us to do is, is to look at, you know, some of the new developments that, that have come into the Blue Badge Service, hidden disabilities, and absorb it within the existing team because we're a lot slicker in terms of how we um, assess and, and the whole user journey through, through the application process. And we're now starting to look more at enforcement and how we can uh, make sure that the Blue Badge Scheme is being administered and followed correctly throughout the borough. And in turn, we're now looking at two to four weeks processing time. So, so customers are getting a much better service. Our transformation journey really started in 2016. Um, and one of the key challenges that, that we had was that we had no base, baseline data to gauge progress outside of customer services. Um, you know, we, we used a channel manager where we could see volumes, um, peak uh, and, and trough in, in demand patterns, uh, activity codes, all, all the things that you would expect from a contact centre platform. Um, but outside of customer services, there wasn't that data available. Um, so, so we took the decision to roll net call uh, our, our uh, channel manager, our, our omni-channel platform uh, across all frontline services in the council and offered con contact centre functionality to the rest of the organisation. And, and we looked at each service and, and made recommendations in terms of the deployment. So, so we looked at full deployment where, you know, it was large services with high demand where we could really start um, changing the way that they deliver frontline uh, contact or, or handle frontline contact. But doing a full deployment, so using an agent desktop and everything that, that came within the platform. Um, but on smaller services, we looked at um, what we called a light deployment where we were just offering um, frontline contact management. So things like um, in hours, out of hours messaging, prompts, queuing uh, facilities, menus, voice forms, call recordings, uh, multi multi channel um, sorry thank you pardon uh, multi channel um, services through one platform and and then the the main part of it was was the management information and the data that we were getting out of it so it allowed Joe's team uh, to start looking at volumes in services demand patterns um, but also what customers were actually you know, contacting is about and allowed them to, to then target their transformation uh, activities based on actual data. Um, so some of the headlines that we got out of that, you know, we, we've got um, the, the platform is like saying in, in all council services. So our, our leisure services, we had three leisure centres uh, or we have three leisure centres across the borough. Um, each centre uh, had its own service and, and the staff uh, or, the, or the contact management was, was delivered by reception staff who were answering phones but also dealing with people face to face and it was quite confusing for them about what their priority was. Do they deal with the person in front of them or did they pick the phone up? Um, so, so we made recommendations based on, on what we could see that the, the you know, the, the, the best approach would be to, to form a leisure hub and, and really segment what, what customer or what staff responsibilities were. So you're either dealing with telephone calls or emails 
or you were dealing with face to face. So we now have a leisure hub um, dealing with uh, inquiries and bookings for all three uh, leisure hub, leisure centres. Um, this is also sat alongside a wellbeing hub. Um, so, so a lot of the support activities um, that the council offers in terms of health and wellbeing. Um, but it's now a more demand responsive service because they've been able to analyse where their demand patterns were. And, and what we've found very very quickly was that the, the rotors didn't match customer demand. A lot of their staff changeovers were actually at their peak demand periods. Um, so we were able to offer advice on um, staffing um, and making sure that they've got the right amount of staff available uh, at the right times for, for customers. But they've now started to look at um, uh, more proactive stuff. Um, you know, it's a very commercially focused uh, service, different to a lot of other services we offer in the council because they're competing with with you know likes of dw pure gym so so they you know they're looking at what value added services they can offer to their customers um so so we're looking at things like proactive me messaging um you know advertising classes um that are available um you know and and um uh, looking at new channels as well so we're looking you know web chat um, online services so, so that was a real change for our leisure team. Uh, we also have two major concert venues uh, in, the, in the borough. We've got King George's Hall and we've got Darwin Library Theatre, very similar to leisure services. They were independent of each other. Um, so, so we moved towards having a booking hub for both services. It allowed them to build capacity. So, so when one was busy uh, and the other one wasn't, the staff were supporting each other. Um, and again, you know, We've started to use, or they started to use proactive messaging for things like on sale activities. So, so when we know that we've got a, a big on sale event coming on, um, you know, we've got messaging on there to let people know when pre sales are, when uh, tickets are available, and actually when they've sold out. And, and the, the venue staff can control those messages themselves. They've got that flexibility to be able to, to make changes very quickly based on what's happening. Um, and they, again, have also started looking at marketing messages uh, within queues, but also um, pre-transfer uh, to an advisor, advertising um, upcoming events. Another one that we looked at was elections. Um, and this was driven by um, local elections in 2013, um, where we were having to, we knew that in build up to, to elections, demand went significantly through the roof for the for the elections team. And um, we were drafting staff in from other parts of the organisation to, to support, support the increased demand. Um, so in the next local election, we, we we looked at doing things slightly differently. So we introduced um, voice forms for electoral registration. So rather than it being an on-demand service, someone sat at the end of the phone, it was an automated service because all we were doing was capturing five bits of information, uh, the name, their address, contact details, national insurance number and the date of birth. Um, and the voice forms allowed us to capture that information, register someone for um, uh, electoral vote or for voting, and then they get a notification within five working days with their um, uh, electoral uh, registration card. Um, so we were able to manage demand um, within the team during that election and reduce calls during the, the six week period up to the election from around about 6,000 yeah. in 2013 to 1,500 oh. in 2015. Mm -hmm. And then we started to develop uh, templates for local and general elections, which can be switched on when, you know, whenever we know that there's an election coming up. We've also introduced web chats so that they can uh, deal with simple transactions through the web. So am I registered? Uh, yes. Um, you know, so it, rather than a phone call waiting in a queue, people can self-serve um, and, and get a, a very quick response through chat. Um, but we also do things like seasonal campaign management. So household inquiry forms uh, are sent out every year. We have pre-built messages that are turned on prior to uh, that activity starting um, and help us to manage demand through those periods through informational messages. Some of the other benefits that it's it's brought across other parts of the business, um, it's allowed us to build capacity within teams. So we've tried to nest services together um, within directorates um, and frontline services. They're all within one core group. Um, and it's, it's a case of 
um, changing priorities, changing skills, if, if you want to add or, or remove people from a particular service within a group. Um, we we're very quickly able to push um, new GDPR messages out on, on all service lines. Um, the one thing that it has, one of the big benefits is delivered is effective complaints management through call recording. Um, something that wasn't available outside of the contact centre prior to doing this, um, and that's allowed us to um, be able to respond in, in a more positive and a more effective way when, when dealing with complaints. And it's helped us to build contingency planning as well. So each of our sites now has an emergency evacuation mode. So, so if a building is evacuated, um, as someone is leaving a building, they can be switching the telephone lines off uh, via a mobile device and letting people know that, that we're not available to take their call at the time. Um, and we, we're starting to build demand responsive messaging as well. So some of our internal services, our IT help desk, uh, whenever they've got, you know, if there's any issues um, around the network, we can very quickly put messages on the front end of the system to stop some of the unnecessary calls coming through to them. Uh, so, so we're taking a more proactive approach to telling people uh, what's happening and, and what we're doing about it. Um, but one of the, uh, well, it's one of the benefits, but also one of the problems, I suppose, is, is that it's, it's created a lot more demand for, for functionality. So, so we started off very slowly, you know, with telephone lines and emails, but people, as they got used to what they could actually do, wanted more, um, you know, which was great, but created a lot of extra work. Um, and one of the big benefits starting to reflect on, on last year, um, because we'd rolled net call out right across the organization, um, when uh, lockdown hit and we started looking at our response to that, which, which Joanne's gonna uh, talk about in a lot more detail uh, later on, um, because people were used to the, the telephone system that, that, that we had in the contact center, we were very easy, it was very easy for us to parachute uh, staff in from other parts of the organizations to support our COVID help hub. Um, so, so our timeline, uh, you know, in the first few days after the national lockdown, 23rd of March, we, we identified staff in areas affected by closure. Uh, so, so our reception staff, uh, leisure services staff, venues staff, finance, business support staff were all parachuted into the to the COVID help hub. Um, 24th of March, the day after, we did staff training on, on FAQs and also the systems that we were going to be using. And we also spent a lot of time doing some resource planning, um, looking at shifts. Uh, 25th of March, we opened uh, at 12 p.m. Uh, till 5 p.m., uh, offering basic advice to, to residents and businesses. And then from the 26th of March to the 31st of July, our opening times were eight till eight, Monday to Friday, nine till one on a Saturday and a Sunday. And we were offering uh, telephone, email support, um, support packages, either self-service or assisted. Um, and we were also doing proactive calls um, based on information we're getting through from the NHS. Uh, so people that have been told to self-isolate, um, we were within 24 hours making an outbound, if they hadn't already been in contact with us, we were making outbound calls to them to make them aware of the services that were available to us. And because the, we, we drafted in a lot of staff to, to, to deal with um, the, 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 the the, the lockdown, uh, we were very demand responsive. So, so we have capacity within the team to, to handle up to a thousand calls a week. Um, and this is just a, a brief um, uh, graph showing our demand. So, so we, we started, like I say, on the 20, well, 29th of March, uh, full, full service. Um, and we saw a peak uh, early May. Um, but then as we got into, well, uh, as we got further into lockdown, we started to see demand drop. But actually what we saw was people were starting to self-serve more. Um, so so the uh, help hub was really, um, you know, the lifeline for, for digitally excluded residents who'd been affected by uh, coronavirus and the lockdown. Um, and then we started to see, as, as we started to return to some sort of normality, uh, demand start to drop. But what we also saw at the same time was an increase in demand on, on normal services. And at the beginning of June, uh, as an example, we opened up our tips, our, our household waste recycling centres, um, but it was a booking service only. Uh, so we redeployed some of the staff from the help hub um, to handle tip bookings. 
um, and, and other services that we're offering as we started to, to recover. Chat services uh, was something that we started to offer in March 2017. Um, and this was a live chat service. So, um, you know, it was an on-demand service via our website, available on benefits, blue badges, council tax, general inquiries, highways, household waste and recycling and parking services. We didn't advertise it. It was, it was a very soft launch um, and the, the service was only available during office hours and it was only available on these service pages. So customers had to find it. Um, so we saw demand uh, start off very slowly um, in, in 2017. But as we started to, um, as well as customers started to find it, we started to promote it. We, you can see the growth that we've seen throughout 2019. 2020 as you know was was quite unique we saw significant growth um, during lockdown people didn't want to talk to us they were they were engaging more digitally um, but that started to tail off towards the end of the year um, and then started to, to build up again this year and I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, the increase that you can see in March 2021 uh, and through to the present day uh, later. But below here, I'm just showing you uh, our telephony demand. Um, so you can see that, that, you know, the introduction of chat, um, but also the introduction of uh, the, the web development and online offerings um, stimulated cha channel shift. Um, you know, we've seen a reduction in calls um, as a result of, of chat being more widely used. So we had a big, big increased, uh, uh, a big demand through the, the pandemic and tailed off as things got back to normality. Um, so in March, uh, well, April 2021, uh, we uh, started using a new product called Web Assistant uh, available through our channel, uh, our platform. Um, chat, and the chat box is now available on every single page and it's available 24 seven. So Web Assistant is very basic chat bot, um, but it's, it's natural language learning um, and, and constantly updating itself. Um, and what we wanted to do was to maximize the, the, the investment that we've made in online services by supporting residents to stay online. So we didn't want uh, you know, customers to be going onto our website to find the telephone number or to find an email address. We wanted them to stay on the website and support them uh, on there through, through a digital channel. So we've offered the same services uh, that we had on our, our old web chat services. Um, but what we've since done is with our general inquiries is to gauge what else we need to cater for. So because the, the, the chat box is now available on every page, customers are asking us lots of questions that they didn't ask for before. And it's allowed us to look at what else we can start to put on uh, the web assistant. So we, we, we're engaging with our school admissions team, planning, business rates, registration services and licensing teams to start in, uh, enhancing, enhancing the offering that we've got through Web Assistant to support people on those services as well. But with their inquiries then being escalated through to that specific team. Uh, so again, changing their demand patterns from traditional telephone email channels to, to more digital uh, offerings. And since March 20 or April 2021, this is just a graph that shows um, the, the amount of contact that's been handled by Web Assistant compared to a live agent. So up until March 2021, uh, it was 100% live agent. Um, but as we've started to develop uh, the Web Assistant and the, the Web Assistant is starting to learn more about uh, what what services we offer, um, it's starting to do more. And we're now at a point where 25% of um, website or, or web uh, assistant transactions are handled by live agents, 75% by our web assistant and customers are finding the information and are being guided to where they can do stuff uh, automate, uh, through automation. The next steps that we're looking at with a web assistant um, is to integrate it with Facebook, Twitter and Instagram direct messaging, SMS and Google business services and enhancing the machine learning natural language chatbot as we offer more services. So it's constantly learning about the new services that uh, we're looking at now and we're programming it to be able to deal with 
around about 80% of the inquiries um, that, that customers will, will fire into that particular service. And this is just a quick look at how our web assistant looks. So it's positioned in the bottom right hand corner of every page. When you click on it, um, first thing it'll ask you is for your name and for your email address. The reason we ask for that is that once someone's actually registered, um, it then uh, remembers uh, that customer's interaction, that customer's detail. So next time they engage with us, and it doesn't matter which channel they engage with us through uh, on, on the new channels that we're looking at, they will be able to see their full conversation history. Um, and, we, and, you know, and as advisors uh, and as a customer service team, we can see that as well when they come through to us. And it's just one continuous conversation, very much uh, the WhatsApp approach. Um, but we also have some uh, pointers in there for, for customers. So we've got our top uh, inquiries on there. None of the above takes us through to our general inquiries team. So if, and if the web assistant can't answer the questions uh, or the inquiry, then it'll escalate through to a live advisor. So what we're focusing on now is very much around customer experience. Um, and the first thing that we, we're doing is, is to change the job title for our frontline staff to reflect our approach. So, so they're now going to become customer experience advisors uh, rather than customer service advisors. We want them to be giving our customers their best experience when they're ringing through to us, no matter what the circumstances, no matter what their inquiry. So we're using new functionality in our contact centre platform to, to start gauging customer experience. So we use an agent evaluation um, within the Netcall platform, um, and that is linked to surveys. So, so we're also starting to look at uh, pushing out customer surveys to, to understand their satisfaction and their experience across multiple channels. So, so in call, um, emails uh, at the end of a chat, but we're also looking at what we can do to enhance um, web services as well um, and gauge customer satisfaction uh, and user experience on our website. But agent evaluation being linked into satisfaction allows us to, to monitor calls where customers have rated them poorly. Um, you know, so we want to understand why customers didn't feel that they, they had a good experience. Now, now, we also know that in some circumstances, it's nothing to do with the advisor. Uh, it's actually they're not happy that they've been given a penalty charge notice or we've missed their bin or we've sent them a council tax reminder. And that allows us to start understanding um, why customers are unhappy, but where we are seeing service failure uh, and failure demand, it's gonna allow us to address it in a more proactive way. Um, we're using real-time feedback that allow us to take that proactive approach to our resident experience. And, and one of the things that we're starting to do is to draw together a lot of the data that we've got available throughout the authority using Power BI um, so to provide true customer insight into um, our, our resident uh, experiences. So it's so using Netcall, Google Analytics, our CRM system, back office systems, but also uh, combined with user research, which again, Joe is gonna go into in more detail. Then what's next? Um, so we are planning to exploit GovNotify platforms to promote online services, uh, GovNotify uh, free, uh, uh, comms platform uh, available to all local authorities and if you put the right case forward you can have as many accounts as you like so we're looking to use GovNotify to send proactive emails out to, to customers um, when they choose for example uh, missed, missed bin collections if they called in from a mobile phone we're going to text them with a, a link to where they can actually do this themselves do this themselves but asking a question, has that helped you? If not, they can still speak to an advisor, but we want to start pushing and, and like I say, getting the most out of our investment in online services. Um, we're gonna open up new digital channels supported by our chatbot. So, so the social media channels I mentioned, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, direct messaging, Google business services, uh, where customers can ask questions and put reviews on um, the, the Google uh, Maps page. Uh, we're gonna be able to respond to them through, through our platform um, and also through SMS. So we're gonna be opening up uh, telephone numbers where people can just type in a couple of words, send it in to us and, and the web chat 
the chatbot will guide them through where they can do stuff or where they can find information. What we're hoping to ultimately do is to reduce email traffic, one by uh, offering more um, uh, self-service options, but also through support by via chatbot. Um, email uh, to me is probably the, our, our least preferable channel. It's very resource intensive, um, you know, open-ended, um, un unscripted emails coming from customers where we're not necessarily getting all the information that we want. We want to be going down a more focused approach of, of actually getting what we need from customers to be able to resolve their inquiry at first point of contact. And all this is going to allow us to, to focus uh, more on in-person in assisted digital services as things return to some sort of normality. Um, so again, we're looking at uh, appointments, but offering reminders uh, via SMS using the Gov, Gov Notify platform. Uh, we're looking at video conferencing facilities, so it's where we can't necessarily offer uh, a face-to-face -face, um, meeting. We're going to alt offer alternatives through through webcams on our public access PCs, where customers will be able to interact and engage with with customer service officers. And, and we're also looking at potential uh, co-location with our, our main library in Blackburn to have supported public access solutions. So at the moment, we have a public access solution in, in our town hall, but we also have a, a massive digital offering in our libraries, and we want to join those up um, and have customer service staff supporting people uh, on all of the public access uh, PCs. And the final thing we're looking at is, is moving away from menu driven options and looking at speech driven telephony and ultimately using our automated switchboard, the, the potential to go down to a golden number. So one single number using our automated uh, switchboard to route callers to, to where they need to go. So making it much easier for residents to get through to the place that they need to get to. If they don't know uh, who they need to speak to, they can still come through to our general inquiry service and we'll be able to signpost them to where they need to speak to. So that is um, our customer services journey. Thank you very much for listening and, and I'll be happy to take any questions uh, in the Q&A session at the end. Excellent. Thank you very much, Ross. I was going to say, yeah, um, if we can leave questions till the end, but there are